from anybody? Any questions? Does everybody have enough mints? Are you doing good? Yes, it is. You doing good? Okay. Any questions? Coke, questions from my middle row, back row? This is a silent lady here in the middle. <laughs> is this your better half? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, here we go, folks. We're on page number 18, behind the scenes. Get ready. Get ready. I'm going to tell you something that I'll bet you in a million years this page was the biggest surprise to me when I first started learn to, to learn to do seminars. There's 10 things that you probably never thought of. Number one is room temperature. You know, maybe you think of room temperature a little bit, but what do you think, this is your Jeopardy question of the day, the optimum temperature is for a seminar room? 68, 72, why do you say that? It's 74 to 76 degrees. Doesn't that sound warm? Yeah, yes, but if you're not careful, they get so chilly they can't concentrate. So here, oh, I see your hand. Here's, here's the deal though with me. Most speakers will try to make themselves comfortable but you're moving around and stuff. So when I'm warm, actually this is, does it feel pretty good in here? How do you feel, pretty good? I'm a little bit warm underneath this right now, so it's probably about 73-ish. But if I'm really warm, you're usually just about right in here. Don't you have a problem with the amount of body heat being given off by the people within the room? Yeah, oh yeah, that's why, that's why you're constantly, actually in a day, I'm checking, I'm looking, I'm watching people to see if they're doing that or see if they're doing this. I know, but I mean, have you ever, have, have you folks ever been to a seminar in a hotel? And it is so cold in the hotel, you're just trying to stay alive until the first break, much less listen to the speaker. And if it's too warm, what happens to them? People start falling asleep, so it's a balance. So I'm watching, this is another reason why I want you to know the content, because I'm kind of watching the body language, I'm watching people talking to each other. I don't mind if you have sidebars, if it's just for a second, as long as it's not bothering the people around you. But when I'm looking, my eye, uh, my eye, uh, eye contact, I'm looking at everything when I, when I talk. I mean, I don't even, I'm, I'm honestly not even aware of every single thing I say, because you, you know this so much, but my goal is to get it comfortable for you. I just think you're gonna, enjoy it a little bit more. Number two is the room setup, styles. Do you know what style this is in here? <laughs> look at that look on her face. <laughs> Classroom style, makes sense, doesn't it? This is where you have two or three people per table. Now I want you to write these down, and it, I don't have a board here, but I want you to draw a little configuration on the page around there. Classroom style is this, pod seating, is when I would have two of these tables together that would seat probably six people around it. Not all the way around it, right? Because I don't want them to have their back to me. But a pod seating is when you get six people. Remember how I had you turn around for that exercise? You're a natural group the whole time. The only problem is about half of you have to kind of sit kind of cockeyed to see me. Corporate stuff now, a lot of people do the pod seating. Banquet seating, can you picture what that's like? What kind of tables? round tables uh, that's great as long as there's not chairs all the way around the tables I can only have chairs around half of the table because I don't want your back to be like uh, uh, at me now if I'm speaking at a an after dinner you know if, you, if you're an after dinner speaker and you're talking you might even do something like this right 45 minutes I don't care if their back is to me for a second because it's 45 minutes, right? They can hold their coffee cup on their lap for a little while, but for a whole class, I want you to be comfortable. Now you said one earlier, what's the one you said earlier? The U-shaped. The U-shaped is great because everybody can see each other, but it's terrible for group exercises because they have to actually move the chairs away from the table. I guess if you have enough room, it's not bad. I don't like it. And if the U-shaped has more than 20 people in it, it's very far down there. The, the, like for example, if this was a U-shaped right now, with you where you are at the bottom of the U, it would be maybe 12 people, 10 people around this table. Imagine 20 people, how much further back you would be. I don't always like it, but boy, the corporate people like that stuff. Boardroom is one. When you have a big boardroom table, 
Uh, that's my least favorite because there's really, you talk about people having to turn around when you walk around, you're literally stuck in one spot. I can't even walk down the middle with something like that. Auditorium style. Do you know what that is? What is that? Oh, you know. I'm, what you, I'm asking the professor. Of course he knows. What do you know about that? What is that? Well, you have essentially like a theater. You have hundreds of chairs. And yeah. And the nice thing about a college setting is sometimes you have those little flip tops, right? They can come out. But generally, it's like a movie theater. You're just... You're just talking to a bunch of people, and that would be for a conference or something like that. But, you know, this is the kind of thing I have seen. You've been out and about, right? But I've never really thought about. Uh, when I do a seminar, and I don't know if we talked about this or not. I think you just set the room up. I think I trusted you on this. But sometimes I'll ask the person, what's the room set up like? Again, for the very reason I want to see the room ahead of time. Do I need it? Sometimes I've actually had to move a room around after I got there early because it was set up the wrong way. Third one is distance to the audience of the speaker. Proper distance to the audience is four to six feet ish. I'm closer than normal right here. I'm a close talker. The only problem with this right here is when I get excited I can spit and you're within range. <laughs> That's right. You gotta be quick. <laughs> That's it. I should have warned you beforehand. <laughs> On a warm day, though, it'll dry up before it hits you. Uh, yeah, so, but, but if I'm too far back, it looks weird, doesn't it? So it's, it's got to be a happy medium. I remember the old days. Well, sometimes you'll even see this now, is they'll have the, they'll have the tables come right up to the front of the room, and the speaker's this deep into it. You know, some of these people that set up tables and chairs, you can tell they don't really, they don't think about the way they're setting stuff up. In the old days of an overhead projector to make sure it project big enough, they used to have to put it back there. Now it's different with PowerPoint, right? Because I can do everything automatically, but I used to have to be here and talk and then walk there and do the overhead projector. It was a mess. Number four is population control. Now this is a classic example of a room that would be a problem. Why? The number of chairs and the number of people. Where does everybody tend to sit? In the back. Now, you folks behave yourselves very well. You're a very good group. But I've actually, when I knew I was going to go to a big, uh, sometimes I've done stuff at colleges or movie theaters. I did some stuff on some military bases. I actually go buy that construction tape at Home Depot, that, you know, that yellow and black stuff. You think that's funny? I'll, I'll rope off where I don't want them to sit. Do they argue about it? No. Where do they come sit? where they can sit. Now, I'm not going to make you sit this close, right, all the time. I might let this many people have twice as much space so you got a little bit more. As a matter of fact, here you go. The, the audience size, population control and audience size. Number five, put down audience size because those two really go together. Population control and audience size have to do with the number of people in here and the amount of room you have. Have you folks ever been squeezed into a seminar before where it's just uncomfortable? I want people to, I don't care if there's actually an empty seat, every other one, it doesn't bother me. I just don't want to talk to everybody sitting in the back like it's a church. One day I let everybody sit where they wanted to and everybody went in the back and I took my, all my information and taught from down there. <laughs> now they're in the front of the room. I never did that again. Number five is, number six rather, is podiums and lecterns. What is that thing right there? What do you stand on? Now a podium, I'm going to let you know, it's probably a foot and a half or two feet tall. Have you ever been in a hotel where somebody's standing on something really tall? If it's about that tall, it's called a riser. If I'm in a room of, for example, if this room was full, I would probably, I should be standing on something a little bit taller so the people in back could see me, but I don't need to stay on something, stand on something that's huge. But podiums and lecterns, number seven is the sound system. And I'll tell you right now, um, I've got a wireless mic for the sake of this video. Uh, this is the best sound system, bar none, that you can have when you speak. It's a wireless lapel mic so you're not messing with cords all the time. Always make sure you have extra batteries if and when you use a sound system. You folks might never use one, but you might have a class someday that you need to have one. Backup batteries are huge. The next thing after this is a handheld wireless mic. Now, if you have to have a wire, try to get a lapel mic with a wire on it, but you're just, just be careful of the cord. For the most part, if you think ahead, you should always be able to plan out really nicely with that. 
Number eight is, uh, number nine rather, is it nine? Eight, eight. 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 audio visuals. And just pr prepare, practice, get ready, right? With the old overhead projectors, we used to carry around a spare bulb. I don't think you can do that with the projector now. They're about $130. Uh, the next one is lighting. This, this lighting in here is probably the worst lighting you could have for a whole day. Yeah, for a few hours, it's not bad. But this is white lighting. Do you know what makes this lighting hard? Those, those what do you call them, bulbs are these, the fluorescent? They blink. Have you ever seen one of these go out? Well, the reason why you don't see it blinking is it goes so fast you don't see it. Your eyes also have twitches. Your eyes move about 4,000 times a minute. They're twitch muscles. And that's why have you ever stared at a computer screen for a long time and you get tired? That's because the computer screen moves. Uh, the best is to have a combination of this with some outside lighting, if you could. Some white lighting is nice. And then number 10 is creature comforts. Uh, that's breaks, water. Do you have snacks? Got great spread here today. Uh, not everybody has this kind of stuff. Do you remember the old days when I first started doing seminars? We used to tell them where the breaks were, where the restroom was. We used to make sure they had water and they had to know where the pay phones were. Wow, do you remember pay phones? Are they still around? Rarely, Rarely anymore. Antique shops. Antique shops, that's probably, you're probably right. The new pay phones have to take your debit card. Is that right, really? Mm -hmm. There are some pay phones, usually in other countries when I've gone there. Uh, look out for bad habits. Vocal interferences. These are, here you go, ready? What are they? Ums, ahs, ums, ahs, and so, like. Okay, like is a big one for kids now, isn't it though? It's wild, man, it's like, it was like, it was like, yes, we went out hunting, it was like, cool, we went like down the road and it was like, what? And he was like, yes. And it was like, I just shot and missed and it was like, whoa. I mean, have you ever, I stopped somebody the other day and said, what are you saying instead of that? I mean, leave the like out of it. What would happen to the conversation? But, and I, I don't expect you to be perfect with this, but, but you've heard it before that it becomes a distraction. Bill Gates, love Bill Gates. I mean, if you're worth $61 billion, you can do what you want, but try to watch him sometimes speaking off the cuff. He doesn't pay any attention to that at all. Vocabulary noise, and I mentioned this earlier, this is you experienced folks. That is jargon, acronyms. Some people like to use, have you ever talked to a person that likes to use big words? Mayonnaise. Just, what's that? Mayonnaise. Mayonnaise? That's a big word. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna have to remember that one, thank you very much. You don't say much, but when you do, it's powerful. <laughs> we used to call them Sunday words. Sunday words? Really? Is that the kind of words you used on a Sunday? No, no. People would hear the, the, um, the preacher using these big words. Oh, oh, I got you. Okay, Sunday words. Very good. I've never heard that before. I'm going to have to remember that one. I'll tell my preacher. <laughs> Grammar noise <coughs> is misused words or sentence structure. Now, let me qualify this. I don't think that's the most important thing, whether you're gra grammatically correct when you speak. You understand that? I, I think in business settings, I do have to, I can speak so fast sometimes I miss my enunciation. I would rather speak a little faster than slower. In business settings, I'm gonna be more careful than talking to a group of hunter ed folks. The most important thing when you sp speak though is I, I love the fact just of the enthusiasm that people have. Try to speak good English if you can so people can understand you, but don't get hung up on it. Structural noise is bad transitions. That's rough, rough transitions from one topic to another. And, I'll, and I would say this, in Hunter Ed, it's usually one speaker to another. You've got to find a way that there's a transition. Am I going to introduce you or not? Do I say the breaks or do you say the breaks? Should I introduce you, then you break people? Should the lead instructor break the people? Do you introduce the next topic beforehand? But those should be planned out to, to sound smooth. And you know when you introduce somebody, when somebody's finished, some of you know this and some of you don't, you should never leave this area empty. When somebody's finished and they're done and they walk off, you should never walk off before the break or you should never walk off before you shake somebody else's hand. 
And, and thank you very much, folks. I'd like to introduce Joe Blow from Kokomo. Joe, come on out here. And Joe comes out, and I say, thank you very much, Joe. Shake his hand, and after Joe's here, then I'll walk off. You see how that goes? It's smooth, it's professional. There's some folks, when they're done, they just walk off. And I've actually done this at conferences where I'll, when I'm wrapping up, when I finish a, a, a keynote speech, you can tell I'm finishing. Today I'm gonna end with a poem you'll be able to tell if you are the person or the MC or the one that introduced me, when you hear me finish, where should you be moving your way to? The front, so that when I'm finished, you come on stage, you say, everybody give Dave another round of applause. I'm just trying to be polite. Thank you very much, and I leave, and then he announces the break or something, but there's been plenty of times I've said, do you wanna, <laughs> do you wanna come up and say a couple things? Should I send him on a break? Is it time for lunch? It's awkward for me. But was that, that was actually kind of my fault for not making sure they knew how to do it beforehand. Emotional noise is uh, number one, and I mentioned this earlier, apologizing. You're just mind wandering for a second there. See, I'm watching out for people, taking care of folks, write that down. Is that pushy? It is a little bit, isn't it? Okay, so it's all right, I want you to do it. This is my job to make sure you get this, isn't it? Okay. Apologizing, admitting your nervousness, and then being negative in front of other people. I don't think you have to smile and be happy all the time, but I need you to be upbeat when you're up here. You're the leader of the whole room when you're up here. Everybody's counting on you. Okay, uh, distractions, that's a great one. Two types of distractions. Does anybody want to take a shot at what an ongoing distraction is? Rain on the roof. Rain on the roof, air conditioner system running. Uh, well, let me see, there's something else I've heard before. What's that? Speaker feedback. Yeah, maybe a little speaker feedback, but it's there all day. So you, every, and if you don't bring it to people's attention, it'll just kind of turn into white noise. A sudden distraction is a siren outside. A, I was doing a thing one day where uh, I was on the ground floor of a Holiday Inn, and the guy, I could hear him. I was speaking to this group of people, and there's the metal double doors in the back of the room, and I could hear about... 200 yards away, somebody had a big weed eater down there and they were coming my way. So, you know, you try to just keep talking through it, but pretty soon it was just so loud and everybody was looking at the door. What do you do? We just listen together and we'll listen to him go. And I said, man, he's doing a great job. And they laughed and I just continued right in with a book. You know what I mean? If it's something everybody notices, you got to you gotta have to notice it, but don't harp on it, right? You just continue on. Speaker distractions. Want to guess? Pacing. What? Pacing? Yeah, that's one. Pacing. Pacing is one. Write that down. That's a good one. Pacing. I didn't have that down, but I think that's a good one. Pacing, and one that I have. Have you ever seen people jiggle change in their pockets? Oh, it sounds weird and. It, Looks weird. I used to have people do this. Where's my thing? Hold on. I know I'm gone. Hang on. I've seen people do this. I used to do this. When they're speaking, they do this, or, or they're doing this kind of stuff. Speakers. It's bad enough when you're doing it, okay? I mean, I've had people click things in the class, and I about slapped the pen out of their hand, but I didn't. <laughs> But, but you've got to, so uh, listen, I've, um, I don't know if you watch basketball, but Digger Phelps for ESPN, he always has a, a marker that's the same color as his tie, if you've never noticed that before. But he has, he doesn't click it, but he has to have it in his hand constantly. I guess if, you know, if you're, if you're that successful and you can do it, go ahead. I just think it's a crutch. I don't think you need to have that. And when I do this, after I use a board, I have to actually make myself set that thing down there or else I'll fiddle with it, which could, can, I don't know if it distracts you, but it could be a distraction to you. Some ladies twirl their hair when they get nervous. That's a distraction. Or some people play with their fingernails when they speak. Some people give handouts. You know handouts. Do you give out handouts? When you give out handouts, should you give them at the beginning, the middle, or the end? Question of the day. What do you mean? Well, uh, one of the things is do you want it to be as a distraction to you as the speaker? Because I'll sit there and start reading my hand down as opposed to this to what you're saying. That's right. I hear that all the time. Don't hand them out in the middle. 
Have you ever had somebody hand them out in the middle and you're not listening because you're wondering whether you got every single copy going around the room? If it's a show and tell, like you're showing a, a, the, a, a shotgun that a shell got stuck in it, show how it blew out, that's different. But a handout, no. Now I do at the beginning because I want you to take notes. If all I want you to do is listen to me and you don't have to write anything down, everything I'm saying is in the information I'm going to hand you at the end, just listen to me and when you're on your way out you can pick up a handout. But 9 out of 10 times, 19 out of 20, I'll give you the thing first. And if you thumb through it while I'm speaking, that just means I'm not doing a very good job. If you thumb through it before I speak, some people like to look through the workbook and see what they have. I think that's great. You know, you can see what you're faced with. But that can be a distraction. Now, environmental distractions, we've talked about it. It could be the temperature. It could be late people. It could be people in sidebars talking to each other in a class. Have you ever had that happen? It's distracting. And listen, if it's a comment, it doesn't bother me, but if it goes on and on and on, it's distracting the people around you. Some people are so inconsiderate, it actually just, I still don't get it sometimes. Some folks are so selfish and self-centered that they've never learned how rude that can be. I just don't understand it. And then the telephones we mentioned are one, too. So I think that's something you have to pay attention to. Yes, sir? Have you ever asked the participants that were speaking in the sidebar to contribute to the uh, conversation? Yeah, I have. I don't want to embarrass them. I try to do it with a look first. And then I sometimes I'll stand by them and talk. But if they continue on, I'll say, did you, have, did you, would you, did you want to comment on this? Because I thought I heard you say something about what we were talking about. And, and they'll, say, they'll say no. And I'll say, oh, well, I don't know. We just heard what you were saying. So just curious. They, they might, I've had one time where it continued on so much, I finally had to say, look, I'm glad that you're interested in the topic, but remember we talked about respect a little bit earlier? It's so disrespectful when you talk when other people around you. You think you're quiet, but you're disrupting the room. So listen, you can do it at the breaks or ask us a question or include us in what you're talking about. Listen, I love you guys and I'm glad you're here, but I'm trying to get this, but you had to push me into that one. I'm not going to do that right away. You understand? Don't you agree with me? I don't want to embarrass people because now if I embarrass somebody, I could potentially have made an enemy, haven't I? And I don't want to do that. I just don't want to do it. My whole, my whole point is these 100 classes are supposed to be fun. Am I not right? They're supposed to be fun and enjoyable, a great experience for you. And you can go through the whole thing and if you want to, and you'll learn something new without ever hunting at all. You'll learn something completely different. Now, the questions and answer period, the, uh, I set the ground rules early for the question and answer period. And, I, and do you like questions as the class goes on? Or do you want me to hold it to the end? Which do you prefer? Do you want them to ask you during your presentation? Well, at the end of the presentation, but then each presentation has Do I have to hold my question till the end, or can I ask you if I'm confused in the middle? If you're confused, I just tell them, raise your hand okay. you know, if you don't understand what I'm saying. Does that sound fair? Does anybody like the questions held to the end? By the end, they're too busy trying to remember their questions yeah. as you're talking. But, but I just, that's something what they're saying is list that stuff out. Tell them how you want this to happen at the beginning. And let me just say this, folks. There are, there are some people in this room right now that are more outspoken than others. I can tell that already. But don't leave here with a question that you have. Don't worry if you think your question is stupid. And let me tell you something, folks. I'll tell you right now. I don't want anybody's question laughed at in this room. You understand that? I don't want anybody to be intimidated to ask questions. We're talking about some serious stuff. It's fun. But I want, I mean, that's the kind of stuff I do at the beginning to get them to relax. Because people are so introverted and shy, particularly some of the youngest kids, they just won't ask a question. Just ask it, man. And listen, if you don't want to ask it, come see me at the break and you can ask me and I'll bring it up to the class when we come back. Yeah. Hunter safety, age-wise, knowledge-wise, uh, everything else that you you gotta respect those questions because what to you is just common knowledge that everybody ought to know. To this person over here, they've never heard of. It. Right. Exactly. You repeat the question. You agree with that, so everybody can hear it. Actually, it gives me a chance to think of an answer too. Could you repeat that, please? Or I'll repeat it for them. Uh, what if you don't know the answer? No. no. I don't know. Listen, let me get my guys in the back here. Do any of you guys know this answer? Let me give it a shot. I've even done this before. Well, you know what? That's a great question. Does anybody in the class want to take a shot at that first? Because in my mind, I have no idea what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can agree with someone in the audience. Nobody really knows for sure. Does anybody here have a smartphone? Who has a smartphone in here? Would you do me a favor and look up that answer for me? Okay, you're off the grid right now. Look up that answer. Let me know when you have it. I couldn't do that in the past. I used to have to wait to the break or make a phone call. 
I had this one, we were talking about how badly people talk negatively about people behind their backs. Happens in just about every working environment. And I asked the class, have you ever heard the phrase, if you can't say something good about somebody, say anything? Have you ever heard that? I said, who said that? And most people say, my mother, my grandmother. We were talking about it, nobody knew for sure, and I continued on with teaching. And this guy in about the eighth row back there put his hand in the air, he had a smartphone. He said that came from the movie Bambi. In 1942, it was a six-year-old German child, and it wasn't Thumper's mother, it was Thumper's father, Thumper's father. I mean, all this is Christ said, thank you very much. I've used that in every seminar for like seven years since he said that. Yeah, I was just looking up the answer. I didn't even ask him to. He said, uh, Bambi was trying to walk on the ice, and Thumper was making fun of Bambi that he couldn't walk on the ice, and Thumper's mother said, what did your father always tell you? So now you got something new. The ping pong question, is when he answers a question and I answer it, and he answers and I answer it, and he asks another one and I answer it, and we're having the best time in the world here. I feel that this room is very interactive, but everybody else is bored stiff. I'll work with this guy for about a couple of questions or maybe a minute, then I'm gonna say, you know what, uh, does anybody else know the answer to this? Or, you know, we gotta move on to another thing. Let's talk about this at the break. If anybody, anybody wants to join us, you can. But there's a technique for handling all this stuff. The body language, right here. Does anybody have a question? Does anybody have a question? How about you folks in the back? Do you have a question? It's better than this. Well, that's all I have uh, for my presentation here. Um, does anybody, anybody have uh, any questions? All right, well, let me turn it over to Jerry over here. It's just, you could tell, do they want questions? You could tell they don't want questions. I want questions. And if you really want questions, set somebody up in the back to ask a question for you. You're on my team. If nobody asks, would you ask a question for me in the back? I can get a lot going. Or I can say, well, you know what? You're not asking any questions. Can I tell you the three questions I get every time I teach this class? I'm gonna start asking questions. This is one. Who, now, who in this room, be honest with me, thought about this during my presentation, this question right here, and you'll get a couple people raise their hands. You, you did think of it, didn't you? Why didn't you ask the question? Well, what's your question then? And I'll get them involved and we'll kid around a little bit and it's kind of fun. It's kind of edgy though, isn't it? I'm on the borderline. You might not be able to do it. I don't know if you're good enough. If there's no questions, I can handle it. The testy troublemaker. Uh, here you go, this is for you. Watch being perceived as rude, defensive, critical, or condescending. I am not, am not, Gonna mix it up with somebody. I'm not. What do you think about that? Have you ever had somebody, have you ever had somebody in one of your classes, they're just flat out wrong. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry. I know you're nice and I respect you, but you're wrong. So let's move on. I'm not gonna do that to her. I are you are you calling me a liar? The guy said one time you call me a liar. You know, no, I'm just saying that I don't agree with your answer. I just think it's, I just don't, don't think it's right. But you know what? I don't want to really get into that now. I'm not, I might be misinformed. Maybe I'm misinformed. Let's talk about it at the break. Okay, everybody, turn over to the next page. I mean, I'm not going to go there. You understand that? I'm not going to get mad at somebody. There was this one time this guy asked me, what do you do when you lose your, your control of your emotions in front of a class? Now, he was talking about crying or anger. Crying? You know, if, if you're telling a story that's super emotional. I was just at the, up in Colorado uh, with the Hunter Ed folks and this guy told a really emotional story. He got emotional, man, about it. There's nothing wrong with that, right? So what? But anger, losing your temper in front of a group that you're teaching, how do you recover from that? Y can I tell you an honest answer? Honest answer, I don't know what to answer because I would never do it. It would never happen. I'll never do it. They'll never pin me to that. Because once you stepped over that line, anger-wise, you know how you, have you ever trusted somebody 100% and they let you down? How hard it is to get it all the way back? I'm just not going there. I'm gonna say, look, that's too serious a topic. We're gonna have to move on. Or somebody wants to talk about politics or somebody wants to talk about religion. We got to talk about it outside, but not right here. Because you know what? I want you to know this rule. When you're teaching, do you know who's in charge of the room when you're teaching? You are, not in a bad way, but I determine when the breaks are, I determine everything that happens in that class. And that's what I mean with a troublemaker. Now, on the bottom, how to handle a hostile troublemaker. Uh, the, the, one thing, the one thing I'm gonna tell you is to kill them with kindness if they're a hostile troublemaker. If, a, if it's a monopolizer, how do you handle the kid or the person that always answered the question? How do you handle that? 
They always answer the question, how do you handle that? Do you let them answer? Yes? Usually tell them to give somebody else a Listen, don't answer this, give somebody else a chance. What's wrong with you? <laughs> not enough. Are you selfish? Not good. It's not like that. That's not it? Exactly like that. <laughs> hey, listen, listen, listen. Just shut up, okay? Give somebody else a chance. Give somebody else a chance. Listen, I know you're going to raise your hand, and I know you know the answer to this already, okay? You know the answer. I want somebody else to answer. You see how that was kind of a compliment? I'm telling me he knows the answer. Now, I'm going to give everybody here, well, I'm not even going to give a time limit. I'm going to, I'm going to make somebody here answer the question, or there's no more breaks today. <laughs> you know what they'll do? Somebody will answer that question. I like to have fun with it. The chit chatters, those are the sidebars. The silent troublemaker, it, it, that's the person with their arms crossed. Is that him? It's not that silent, he's a troublemaker. That's what he said, man. I love the point, man, that's great. You know the, yeah, have you seen this, look at this. Okay, so what do you do with a dude like this in your class? Go ahead and continue that, see if we can get a shot of that, man, that's good. Oh, I think the camera's right on you, man. What do you do with that person, though? They're kind of like the hostile troublemaker, aren't they? You don't confront them until the breaks, and then I use my Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People, and I'll go find out about that person. I'll, I'll introduce myself and shake their hand. I'll say, you know what, you seem like you've got a lot of knowledge about this topic. Tell me a little bit about your history here. And I might actually you know, call on him for advice in the next section, and I'll make him friends. He's okay, he's just, somebody made him come and he didn't wanna be here. He wants to be working around his house. But I'm, again, I'm not going to fight with people. You understand that? I'm not, I'm not going to get there. I'm not going to go there. Or if they're sitting like this, it might be because the room's Yeah, it might be, but then he's not going to have that huge scowl on his face. <laughs> uh, give him a break. How often do you give him breaks? At least every 50 minutes. Yeah, 45, 50, 55. I mean, when you think about it, that's how long our classes were when we were in school, weren't they? And then you state the schedule, the breaks, you tell them how often, you tell them how long. Synchronized watches. I like to tell people if we're going to take about a... Now, I've been loose with you folks today, but normally in a real seminar, I would say it's 2.22 in the afternoon. Let's take a 15-minute break and come back at 2.37. It's just something that breaks that thing up rather than let's take about a 15-minute break, which usually turns into about a 20-minute break. And, and you can have a... It's up to you at about a minute before the break is up. Just start calling them back in. Get the people out in the hallway. Do you mind getting those folks out there? And then start, start your speech. And this is a big one for the folks that you work with. Some of you work with people that can't end their section on time. Man, you know what I mean? This is what the team meetings are about. You've got to end it on time. You understand that? And if you want to, at the very end, I'll hold my hand up at the end before you speak. I'll be your guy. I'll evaluate you. I think you should do that, L LBs and NTs. What does this mean? I have the next speaker start walking to the front and they can see it. And look, at if this person gets irritated, don't get irritated. We talked about this, didn't we? We agreed on this, didn't we? So come on, you just need to follow your notes a little bit better. It's not a big deal, but I'm serious. I'm big on that one. Because when we say this is over with at 4, when is it over? It's over at 4, it's over at 5. Because if you say it's over at 4 and it goes till 4.30, they stop listening at 4 o'clock. What the audience knows without being told, they know how you feel. That's your body language and the things you say. You, they know if you don't like them. They know when you're lying. They know when it's a sales pitch. They know when you've given up. They know when you haven't prepared, which is the, which is the big one. Now, the very last section we have here is the psychology of a confident delivery. And there's five very interesting things in this section. Uh, the page that is, uh, says build audience rapport, five factors. These are the last things we're gonna talk about today. On page number 26, their appearance. What did I say about appearance? Level above. Level above. Okay, the body language, we're going to talk about that. Those are your gestures, the tonality and speech, how to sound enthusiastic, audience enrollment, how to get people excited, and we're going to talk a little bit about just the use of humor in a class. There's five things, and I want to start with appearance on the very next page. Now, I'm going to talk about appearance not just with Hunter Ed. I'm going to talk about the appearance in general. I said I like it a level above, um, but if... That, that is appropriate, but I want you to notice when 
when people notice your appearance, there was a survey that I read that shows the five things people notice about your appearance. The first thing they notice, and this is a big one, I think, it's whether your clothes are neat, clean, and pressed. Do you, are you thrown on or do you look like you've been put together? Have you ever seen people come to work and they look like they took their shirt out of the glove compartment just before they put it on? <laughs> uh, you folks, I believe, just any kind of uh, law enforcement, they're big on appearance, aren't they? I mean, you can't look sloppy, shoes can't be dirty. I mean, your shoes are a little bit different because sometimes you're tramping around in different things, but it's big. Why do you think appearance is big for law enforcement? It's that first impression, isn't it? Visual body language is 55% of it. Have, have you folks ever made an, has anybody ever made an impression on you? You formed an opinion of somebody and you never even met them. It's just from, it could be the hat they had on or the clothes they had on. It's big. Bold is better. In these classes, honestly, camouflage, fluorescent orange, whatever configuration you want to have, I love it. I think it's great. Uh, do you ever have people teach a uh, honor ed class in street clothes? Would you teach it probably in that, correct? Yes. The section, you, do you teach a law enforcement section? We do, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. I just think it's important, I really do. And I think you guys are great, but a new instructor, I would lay down the law in a nice way. This is the way it's gotta be. I've seen some people teach in an old t-shirt, old blue jeans, muddy boots, and a ball cap on backwards. Can you, can you imagine that? I mean, yo, yo, it looked like they walked out of a nightclub. Style is better. Now for women and men, the style can be a little bit different. I'm sorry. I think ladies are different than guys and they, can, they have more flexibility to do a little bit more than a guy does. Uh, if you have glasses and you need to teach in glasses, that's fine. Just know full well that if you teach with glasses, you're going to have a little bit of glare and they're not going to be able to see your eyes a lot, but it's not a big deal. If you were going to teach all the time, I would tell you to get non-glare glasses. <clears throat> does anybody have reading glasses here? Can I see your reading glasses? Do you need these to teach? No. Okay. They're 175. Okay. I had cataracts and had them removed. Oh, is that right? But you still need reading glasses? Yeah. I had LASIK, but I still need reading. I have about six pair of these all over my house. Uh, listen, if you need glasses to teach, I would rather that your notes are big enough that you don't need to see them unless you're just blind as a bat. Now, if you need reading glasses, you can probably see, but you just need something to see here. Uh, I don't mind if you teach with glasses, but I don't want you to teach like this. I mean, I've seen, I've seen some political folks will teach like this. Now, I've read something, an article that was really small, and I need these to read, you understand? So I read an article with these on, but when I was done reading the article, I took them off. I'll use it for some small things. If there's a personality test I give somebody, the letters are real small, but for the most part, I'll always have them up front, but they're on and they're off, they're on and they're off. I don't want to be looking down at somebody. School, yes, what are you doing? I mean, there's a whole look to that thing, isn't it? I like that. Uh, and then appear to be, bottom of the page, number four. Here you go, sir. Thank you. Yep. Walmart? Uh, yep. Yeah, okay. I think I, I, think, I think I actually have a pair of those. Uh, appear to be, four things, sincere and genuine. This is number four on your page. Sincere and genuine, warm and friendly. What is that? Smile. There are some instructors that I have seen that are very tough in the way they teach and they lay it on the law and you will do, you won't do. Listen, I understand that's a style, <coughs> but you don't need to rule people like that when you teach a class. Teach the class, for heaven's sakes, be likable. This is not a prison, right? You will do this, you won't do this, you will do this. My natural inclination when I hear that is to do what? Oh, yes, I will. <laughs> so whether I'm right or I'm wrong, I wanna fight back. You don't need to get like that. Be warm and friendly with folks. You can be authoritative, but still be soft and friendly with people. Uh, sincere and genuine, warm and friendly, enthusiastic, enthusiastic, and committed. Committed. And if you can in a class, it's not always the case, but if you can guarantee something, if you can guarantee something, try to guarantee it. It just makes you sound like you're committed. You know, if there's anything, like when I talk to folks, 
Now, I, I can talk to people about how to help higher uh, self-esteem. I have four things. I'm not going to teach it now, but I can teach people. If you do these four things for 30 days, you'll feel better about yourself as a person when you're done. I'll guarantee it because I've done it and I've had a lot of other people do it. If you have something in your life that you want that's specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound, and you want it so bad you think about it all the time, you're thinking about it constantly and it meets those five criteria, there's a 100% chance you'll get it. The only reason people don't get what they want in life is most people don't know what they want, so they don't get it. I can guarantee that. Why? Because I've done it. I've done it with people before. Does that sound like it's, it's not far-fetched. I don't want to promise something like if you take this, if you take this class, I'll guarantee you'll always have a safe hunting experience. Is that true? <laughs> not really. No, you got to do it. I mean, if you do the things we taught, you're going to, can you guarantee it? You know, maybe not if, maybe not because there's other people, but I'll be very close to that. I mean, if you do what we say, this stuff is time tested, isn't it? It's not just something we came up with. This stuff works. I can just almost guarantee that. The only thing I can't guarantee is the other people that you might be with. But see, I, you see how sincere I can sound? I'm selling something, man. Zig Ziglar, talk about enthusiasm. Zig Ziglar said this once, the word enthusiasm, enthusiasm. The last four letters of the word enthusiasm are the letters I, A, S, M, that stands for I am sold myself. I'm sold on it. I'm excited about it. Listen, if you teach a class with excitement, what it's meant to you, the people you've helped, stories of people that took this class and came back and you changed their lives or now they're in the military. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that's gonna, gonna you talk about spice, that's the kind of stuff that's gonna sell people. But if you sit here like some deadhead in a monotone voice and read out of a book, you're, you could probably record that and use that to put people to sleep when they have insomnia at night. You could actually probably market that, I guess instead of taking drugs. The next page is about body language. This is the gestures that you use. I'm gonna tell you something that a lady told me that she works for a law firm. Um, here's the percentages. Words are 20%. Tonality is 25. That's tone of voice, right? And if you're married, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> and body language is 55. So the nonverbal is tone and body language, correct? That's nonverbal, how much is that? Do you understand? There's only, t there's 20, when you talk to people and present, this is depressing to me as a guy who speaks for a living. I don't know if you've experienced this or not. But people only hear 20% of what you say. They mind wander, and I've, we've seen examples of that today, no offense. I mean, since I started speaking a few hours ago, most of you have probably already been home once at least. Some of you are at Walmart, some of you are at the grocery store, some of you are wishing you were downstairs, some of you are wishing you went to the bathroom at the last break. <laughs> it's not an yes. I'm watching you, man. But it's normal, isn't it? People just deal with it. You deal with it. That's why, that's why I say stuff over again. That's why I have you write stuff down. Did you know that if you write something down, have you ever gone to the grocery store for five things? And you don't have a list, you just thought about them on the way home, and somewhere between your car and the store, you've completely lost one of those items. You didn't forget it because you remember it when you get home. But if you wrote those five things down and put that uh, note in your pocket or your purse, you'd remember all five of those without even looking at it because it has another impression on your head. That's why you got notes. Listen, it's going to be a challenge to, to communicate words. I understand that. That's why you help people out. You give them some answers. You have them write things down. You review at the end of every session, all these things. But the tone is 25%. So much of what you say, have you ever told somebody it really wasn't what you said to me? It was how you said it? That's the tone. And then the body language is the acronym you see on the page. This is what a lady who studies uh, body language for lawyers taught me. These are the six things people notice about you first when, you, when they see you and they see you speak. Number one is your smile or your facial expression, she says. You don't have to smile all the time, but when I used to do seminars, when I started doing seminars, I wrote in my workbook in bright orange letters, don't forget to smile because I was too serious about the topic. Have you ever seen a hunter instructor that needs to lighten up a little bit? Man, he's scaring people. 
Man, oh man, I know it's serious, but gee whiz, I gotta sleep tonight. O stands for open posture, and F stands for a forward lean. That's how you sit, it's how you stand, it's how you look, it's how you're dressed, it's how you wear your hair, the whole, the whole deal. T stands for territory, that's how close you are to people. We said four to six feet when you speak, if you're standing side by side to somebody and we're talking one on one, like we were over here, three to four feet is probably comfortable. I wasn't too close, was I? But have you ever had somebody that's a little in your space? It's distracting. The E stands for eye contact, and this is an art when you speak, I believe, is learning how to connect with people in the audience. You don't have to do it in a special order, but you gotta have that confidence. And it's tough, because the guy in the front row, I'm gonna see him a lot, more than the person here who's kind of behind you, and you're kind of behind him. It's not as intense when I look at you as when I look at you, so I am conscious in my mind of how long I'm looking without creeping somebody out. Particularly the guy, well, a guy looking, a guy looking at a woman, you've got to be careful because it's a, or a guy with a guy, but look at you and you know, whatever, you know. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> we might need to edit that out, man. <laughs> you know what I mean. I don't want you to look over the top of the room like a lighthouse. Have you ever seen these folks? This is our eye contact. Look at people. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's, like, it's only about a second or two, isn't it? 1,001, 1,002, and then you change to somebody else. Go back and forth. Leonard's a little bit tough to see because he's behind. I got a name for you. Yes, sir. I like to find it. If I've got a large audience and I'm a little nervous, I like to find a friendly person. Yes, audience. sir. Maybe one I've met before, maybe yep. one I've never seen before, yep. but somebody that's vibrating friendly. That's it. And keep going back to that Yeah, person. but not too much because you'll creep them out, though. But, you know, just, just, <laughs> enough, just enough so that I've got it. That's <laughs> yeah. my, kind of my crutch, so to speak. Yeah, that's good. I like it. You know what I would say? Have three people like that that are friendly so i had one guy do a presentation it's 10 minutes there's was a whole room full of people and he looked at me the whole time and i felt like i was checking my clothes and my mixture my flies up i ran out the door when it was over with who had their hand up here yes sir back in the old days they used to teach you to look over the tops of the people's heads yeah that's see that's what they're not doing anymore because you can see it now let me say this if i'm in a room of 300 people yes you know, my front row is down there. Yes, I'm looking out, and I'm and actually I look out, but I pretend like I'm looking at people. But in a room this size, this is my chance to sell you, isn't it? Talk about how serious it is, but just only for a couple seconds. And then the N stands for head nodding. I always I always look to see if people are. I had a, this is what I do in the audience. I look to see if people are listening to me or if they're distracted. A lady. This lady said, if somebody's sitting up straight there's about a 95% chance they're faking paying attention. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, when you were in school and weren't paying attention, what did the teacher say? Yeah. Sit up straight. So, so in other words, this isn't paying attention. I said, what do people look like when they pay attention? And she said, people start off like this. Have you ever nodded off before? I know you have, not today though, right? <laughs> have you ever done this at work before? You're sitting there and you go, and then the eyes just, and then you, go, then you go completely out like he did. Have you ever done this? It's embarrassing when you're around folks. I had one of these twitches. You ever had one of these twitches? I did one of those on an airplane and tripped the flight attendant. She was coming down the hall, but kicked her right in the shin. But you straighten yourself, don't you? Wake up. And I, she says is when people tune in, their neck muscles relax and their head tilts to one side. See, look at your head, it's tilted. People's heads are tilted to one side or the other when they're really tuned in. Or their body can be really cattywampus. Like you're, you're a little bit tilted and your head's another way. But isn't it true though, because you tune in. And she said another thing, if people are chewing on something while they're listening, it means they're really interested. Like if they're chewing on a pen or a pencil, she said it's almost like they're hungry for more information. I, I just thought it was fascinating kind of stuff. But body language, and when you gesture, when you speak, don't be afraid to get big with yourself, your gestures. You know, talk about something. How big was it? Man, that was that big. Because many times when people aren't comfortable speaking, they're, they're very stiff. Have you ever seen people speak and they do the fig leaf thing? You know, or they do the military fig leaf. Or have you ever seen folks that hang their thumbs in their pockets? They don't know what to do with their hands. Just like when you're talking to friends. When you're sitting there talking to somebody, don't you talk? It's funny when I watch people speak, they're stiff. 
And then I ask them questions about their presentation and the, and the shield comes down and they just talk to me about stuff because they're not thinking in their mind, they're just being themselves. Look at that's what I want you to be when you present. Just be the normal person you are with friends. People, when you think about it, why are people afraid to speak in public? Because they're afraid of looking stupid in front of other people. The way to avoid that, prepare, practice, rehearse. And then do it enough times. Look at people are going to be accepting if you respect them by preparing. When you embarrass a person or humiliate somebody by thinking so little of them, you don't work on your presentation, that's how little you thought of me that you're going to look at it the day before. That's how little you thought of this program. Well, I, I am humiliated personally. Now, I would never say that to you, but I'm thinking that. You understand that? That does make me mad. But if it's obvious you've given an effort, you're doing the best you can, and you're trying, aren't you on somebody's side when you're in the audience? Aren't you pulling for them? That's what I want these new folks to know. The uh, second to the last thing here is, uh, the next page is improve your vocal quality. And see where it says pitch inflections, volume, loud and soft, rate of speech, overall uh, quality. I want you, overall quality is enunciate, like I said, I'm still working on. But the volume, loud and soft, and rate of speech, you see those two together? That's where you get your sound of enthusiasm from. Did you know that? The louder you speak and the faster you speak, you sound more enthusiastic than if you speak low and slow. If you try to enunciate too clearly, it can sound very boring. I'll give an example. Hello, everybody. My name is Dave Oaks, and I have a company called Dave Oaks Seminars. Thanks for coming out today uh, to do public speaking without fear and anxiety. I think you'll find that these next few hours are going to be exciting. We're going to talk how to overcome nervousness and how to put a presentation together. Have you ever heard this before? Oh, my gosh. I get this for six hours. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dave Oaks. I'm with Dave Oaks Seminars. Thank you for coming out today. We're going to do a program called Public Speaking Without Fear and Anxiety, and I think you'll really enjoy these next few hours. We're going to talk about how to overcome fear, how to put a presentation together. Do you see how you just, just the voice can make it sound? And then you get in there with some gestures, and how crazy was he? Man, he was crazy. How, how crazy? He was really crazy. How crazy was he? He was crazy, man. You know? You understand what I'm talking about? Tell a story. How big was that fish? It was big. How big was that fish? Man, it was... It was... Listen, that fish wasn't really, really, really big. That fish was big. No, no, not even that. Big. I mean, you could... You know what I mean? How cold was it? It was really, really, really cold. I think it couldn't fit in the picture. Yeah, that kind of thing. That's the reason. How cold was it? It was, it was just so cold. You could almost feel it. I mean, it was so cold. It was, how cold was it? It was really, really cold, man. It was minus 15. It's not the same thing. It was cold. My extension cord, I plugged in my car in Fairbanks, Alaska. It froze. It's cold, man. Enthusiasm. Then you have audience involvement. And listen, let me just say, there's a couple things I want to say about this. And I think you folks are probably good at this, but comfort, you're looking for comfort, commonality, control, and commitment. The exercise should be something that's not out of the bounds of what you know, and it's not going to make anybody feel afraid or hurt anybody. You know what you're talking about, right? Raising the gradient is what I want you to write down. Uh, the first one, you know the group exercise we did where I got you in groups first thing today? That's the kind of thing, that's what I want you to put down, small groups. You don't have to do it, but that's a very non-threatening way. Do you know five or six young kids and adults will talk in a group, but will not talk openly to me in a class? Now, if I can have one spokesperson in a kidding fashion give me their list on a board, I now have about 20 different things on my list that I never would have gotten by talking to an entire group. That's what I'm talking about. I've got to start, start off in a more threatening environment. If you just looked at the way we spent this day together, you were more stiff at the beginning. You're much more loose to speak up as the day goes on because the gradient of didn't put you under any pressure when we started out. Second one uh, is to ask them to do something non-threatening. Nobody gets embarrassed. Nobody has to stand up on their own. Now, I want you to take notes. And whoever the note taker is, when I ask for the list, I want you to give me the list. That's non-threatening. I have seen people with the list handed to the person next to them and say, here, you tell them. And that's fun because what are you doing with each other? 
You're interacting and making friends. That's really all I want. And imagine this. I did a, I did a seminar for a, a big government organization in a few years back. And every break, there are four tables of five people. Every break during the day, two breaks and lunch, they had to change and sit in a new place for three days. The whole theme was to get them used to change. But they, everybody knew everybody by the end of the three days. The trust level was 100% across the board. It's, it was hard to do, but it was very exciting. The last one, number three, is involve them in an activity at, at some point. Look at the games trainers play stuff on site. Look at, uh, look at uh, seminar games for hunter ed education courses or whatever. Be a little creative, do a little bit of research. And the last uh, section I wanna show you and I saved the best for last is the Humor Me page. This is a page that I found from a gentleman on tape. His name is Roger Dawson, and he, on his tape, spoke of the five kinds of jokes in the world. Does anybody here, do you guys like jokes? I love jokes, but my biggest challenge is, is I have a tough time remembering the joke. He said there's only five jokes in the entire world. I said, get out of here, man. I was watching Comedy Central. The guy told jokes for an hour. He said every, every single joke you've ever heard is a derivative of five jokes. There's only five kinds. The first kind of joke is called an exaggeration joke. If you watch Jay Leno or David Letterman or Jimmy Fallon or Jimmy Kimmel or Craig Ferguson, Conan O'Brien, their monologue is the news of the day exaggerated in some way that made it funny. Johnny Carson made this famous. 30 years ago when he said it was so cold outside and the audience would say, how cold was it? And he said it was so cold outside, I saw the politicians in Washington, D.C., they had their hands in their own pockets. And the audience would laugh. So hot outside, how hot was it? It was so hot outside, I saw a dog chasing a cat and they were both walking. I don't know, they laugh. The second kind of joke is called a pun. A pun is a play on words. Henny Youngman made this famous 50 years ago, take my wife, please. We thought I was gonna say take my wife, for example. Any joke you've ever heard that makes you moan at the punchline is a pun. There's a guy in New York City I heard about a few years back, got himself cloned so he could get more work done. He was gonna stay at home while his clone went to work. Well, his clone, as happens, sometimes started hanging around with bad people at work started getting a bad reputation, telling dirty jokes, being obscene with women, killing this guy's reputation. So the guy tried to talk to the clone and couldn't catch up with him. So he thought the only thing he could do was to kill the clone. He figured if he killed the clone, nobody would know the difference because it's a clone. He just had to go back to work. So he chased this clone all over New York City, up and down the streets, finally got him cornered on the top screen of the Empire State Building. The clone was trying to crawl over. The guy reached up with a stick and poked the clone pushed the clone off and the clone fell to his death and he thought that was the end of it. When he went downstairs to leave, the police were there to arrest him and they said, what are you here to arrest me for? And they said, for making an obscene clone fall. I told you, man. That was one long trip. Yes. You're probably gonna use that in church too. I know you are, man. There's nothing, nobody can tell a corny joke like a pastor, right? Third kind of joke is a personal put down. Rodney Dangerfield made a fortune out of cutting himself down. And if you think about it, there's not as many comedy teams now as there used to be. But if you remember back in the old days, Abbott and Costello, Laurel and Hardy, Martin and Lewis. Remember Roan and Martin on Laugh In, Sonny and Cher, the Smothers Brothers. I guess Penn and Teller, the magicians, are kind of like that now. But you know, remember one was straight, the other was the comedian would cut the other one down. It would be, it would be funny. Uh, the fourth kind of joke is called silliness. This is the Three Stooges. Anybody ever watched the Stooges growing up? Or the Groucho Marx, Groucho Marx, last night I killed an elephant in my pajamas. How he got in my pajamas, I'll never know. It's that corny humor, slapstick. You ever watch the food fights with the Three Stooges? It's funnier when they're wearing tuxedos and long gowns and throwing pies. Speaking of pies, anybody remember Soupy Sales? Wasn't he famous for throwing pies? And then the last one is called a surprise joke. It's when it changes direction. It goes from one direction to another, completely different than you thought. These two guys went to a downtown uh, New York City to a diner and 
and it was a greasy spoon. And they were going to get something to eat. And when he walked in, he looked over at this waitress in the corner, and he kind of hooked up on her for just a second. The eyes hooked up, and he smiled at her, and she smiled at him, and got kind of a tingle. She was beautiful. So when he went to sit, sit down on the stool next to his buddy, he looked over at her, and she was actually looking at him. He looked at her and smiled. She smiled back, and, and he just felt really good about himself. So she came over and smiled at him really sweetly and said hi, and he said hi. And she said, can I help you? And he looked at his menu and looked back at her and said, yes, you sure can. And she said, what would you like? And he looked at her and said, well, I'd like a quickie. And she slapped him and knocked him off his stool. His buddy helped him off the ground and said, I think the word you're looking for there is quiche. <laughs> It'll sink in. Here you go, guy was playing golf. Guy was playing golf. He came back and his wife said, how come it took you so long to play golf? And he said, well, George had a heart attack on the second hole. So it was hit the ball, drag George, hit the ball, drag George. What kind of, what kind of joke is that? Sick. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, think it's, I think it was one of those exaggeration jokes, you know. The guy says, did you pick my ball up? And the guy says, you know what? He said, he makes a putt. And he says, would you pick my ball up? And the guy says, at my age, I don't want to get too close to a hole in the ground. <laughs> Listen, are, are jokes, though, kind of fun sometimes? You, and, and I used to tell jokes in seminars until on the evaluation one time, the lady said, I really enjoyed the seminar, but didn't know I was going to have a stand-up comedian as a presenter. I didn't want to be a stand-up comedian. So I changed my view to not telling jokes. I do some. I mean, I do in this section, and if I hear a clean joke, it's got to be clean, right? Wholesome joke. But if you hear a good one, tell it. You don't have to tell them. But I want you to have a sense of humor. Laugh a little bit. So that's four sections we've talked about today. The, first, the very first section we talked about today, it's amazing, isn't it? It went faster than you thought. We talked about the first one is solutions for anxiety. That was the first four pages of the workbook. The second one is plan a powerful presentation. How many, uh, how many steps to plan a presentation? Nine. Right, nine steps. The second section was just going through the nine steps. The third one, the third one is controlling the presentation environment. And I think the most impressive thing about that is, is page 18 with the 10 things I've listed on there we've talked about. And then the last one is psychology, and that's your parents being enthusiastic, knowing some humor. You can watch one of these, you can watch all four of these, you can watch two of these. Um, I want to finish with a poem, though, before we end today. But before we do, I just want to ask, does anybody have anything in here that you're unclear about? Do you remember the three words on page four? What are they? PPR. Prepare, practice, rehearse. Fifteen minutes per minute, agreed? For a new person, for a new person, fifteen minutes per minute. For somebody that's been doing it that just needs to change it up a little bit, maybe 10 minutes per minute. But there is some information there that we can get out of that. Well, if you don't have any questions, I want to end with this uh, one poem that I heard years ago. It's anonymous. I don't even know. I don't even know who said it, who wrote it. But when I read this for the first time, I thought, this is exactly the message I'm trying to get across. And this is what the person wrote. I've heard speeches to many big groups. I've seen motivators that can stir up the troops. I've seen all styles, and I've studied the art, but the kind I like best comes right from the heart. So if you're asked to speak, leave the script in the chair, get up on that stage and show them you care. No need to be clever, don't try to be smart, instead just be natural, speak right from the heart. Find something about yourself you can improve, and just remember, one of my favorite commercials is the Nike commercial. What do they say at the end? Just do it. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.